Income Tax 2023-2024, Reporting Rental Income Expenses and Losses Tax Software Example. Get ready and some coffee because we're going to stop the tax man in his tracks with income tax preparation. Okay, maybe we can't completely stop him in his tracks, but we're going to slow him down. We're going to slow the tax man down before, before he makes off with our grandma's antique china set. Here we are. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. In our form 1040 example problem using LACERT tax software, you don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to software, great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Standard starting point, we've got Adam Tax Man just trying to avoid a dang tax ban. He's living in Beverly Hills, 90210. Single filer to start off with, no dependents. We're going to start with W-2 income at the 100000 and then we'll be comparing and contrasting that to rental income, both reported on a Schedule C compared to that reported on a Schedule E. We're starting out with the standard deduction of 13850. That's going to give us the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula, taxable income, 86150. Page two, calculating the tax, letting the software do that. That's coming out to 14266. All right, back to page one. So now we're looking at the W-2 because that's typically the default income so that we can compare and contrast it, noting this time we're going to be looking in particular at loss situations. And when you have a W-2 income, you don't usually have a loss situation. You don't typically even have expenses usually that are tied directly to the W-2 income, which is kind of weird because normally in an income tax system, we would expect those things to be deductible being the things necessary to consume ordinary and necessary expenses in order to generate the income. We don't have that as W-2 employees because the employer is expected to be expending the ordinary and necessary expenses, one of those being the payroll to the employee. Therefore, if we're a W-2 employee, we basically just have the income side of things and therefore we're not going to be able to have a loss because we don't have any expenses in essence to net against it. Now, of course, we do have like above the line expenses and we have this, the itemized deductions, for example, but those aren't really business expenses. Those are other types of expenses or deductions for income tax purposes. We don't really, we're not going to result in a loss from in essence our income making activity because we had more expenses to make the income than we have income. So that's the first point that we wanna be comparing to with the W-2 income. When we go to our own business, either reported on a Schedule C or a Schedule E, we will then see that we have to make uh, payments, expenses that are ordinary and necessary to generate the income. And it's quite possible, particularly in some years, to have more expenses than the income resulting in a loss. Now, of course, the IRS is going to be skeptical of losses because if they have a loss, the IRS, as our silent partner, is not going to want to pay us. They're not just going to write us a check because our silent partner says, oh, you lost us money, we'll give you the, the difference. No, they're going to say, 
uh, we're going to limit the losses most likely. So if you don't have any other income to take the loss against, you might not get any benefit for the losses. Even if you do have other income to take the loss against, such as W-2 income, they, they might limit it to the W-2 income or say, hey, we're not going to allow you to take the business loss against the other W-2 income in some instances, especially if it's rental property because they're going to call it passive income. And those are some of the things we're going to touch in on this time. So as a general rule, if when we switch this to the rental income, we will typically be thinking about the Schedule E. Remembering the Schedule E is basically an income statement typically broken out by individual property and therefore is similar to the Schedule C. So you might say, well, why don't we just use the Schedule C when it's basically just an income statement? And at first glance, you might say, well, that's because the expense categories are different and I don't have the columns for the different properties and whatnot. And it's like, yeah, that's part of it. But also the, the point is that with the rental property, we have some differences because they might call it passive income. So in other words, if you were a real estate professional, in some cases, you might still be reporting on the Schedule C because you're an active business. And when you report on the Schedule C, you might be subject to the self-employment tax on the negative side, but on the positive side, you might be able to more likely take some of the losses. Whereas if we're on the Schedule E, then we're gonna typically have added loss limitations for the at-risk limitations being one, but also the other one possibly more likely to hit more people, the passive activity loss limitations. And then we get into the realm of, uh, are we an active participant? And possibly can we take part of our losses even though they've been categorized as passive activity? So if we have rental income, the question is gonna be, do I report it on a Schedule C or do I report it on the Schedule E? If I report it on the Schedule E, I might have loss. Do I have a loss? If I have losses, I have the two loss limitations worksheets, which is a 6198, which is the at-risk limitations, and then the 8582. So we're going to say 85. Where is it? I can't really see. There's a glare on my computer. Here it is. So 8582 passive activity loss limitations. So that's going to that's going to be the idea. So let's first do the comparison and say, all right, notice if I go to this schedule C, uh, I mean, I'm, my 1040, I have my W2 income and everything's pretty straightforward. I've already paid my Social Security and Medicare, so I don't really have to deal with that, even though it's on the W2. Let's pretend then that we're going to go to the schedule C just as a comparison. So I'm going to delete the W-2 and, and just here note that I'm not going to have a loss. It's like impossible to have a negative W-2, right? That doesn't make sense. So, if, but if I go to the, if I go to the Schedule C, then I could have a loss, right? So I could say, all right, what if I had income do, 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 of 100, let's say 120,000. And then we're going to say that we had the uh, advertising of 20,000. There's our standard example. I go back to my forms. And now we can see that if I go to the Schedule C, we've got the 120 minus the 20. There's our income statement, gives us the 100,000. We're able to take a deduction and expense because it's an ordinary and necessary business expense, whereas we wouldn't have been able to take the these types of expenses if it was W-2 income generally. The 100,000 flowing into the form, the Schedule 1, there it is. That flows to the form 1040, there it is here. And we also have on the Schedule C, the net 100,000 flowing to the Schedule SE, self-employment tax, uh, resulting in Social Security and Medicare, which hasn't been paid yet because we have no employer to withhold that from our earnings. Therefore, it's part of the calculation, 14, 129, 1040, page two. There's the 14, 129. It also goes through the schedule two, but there it is, the 14, uh, 129. Remembering that 
in order to properly compare this to the W-2 income, you have to recognize that you already paid that on the W-2 side. However, you only paid the employee portion, and this is basically the employee and uh, employer portion that you have to do yourself because the employer isn't forced to do it for you by the IRS making the employer their little tax collector. So then let's go back on over and say also on the Schedule SE, we've got the 14129. We get half of that as a deduction. That flows into the form, uh, the, the Schedule 1, Additional Income and Adjustments, page 2. And then there we have on line 15, Deductible Part of Self-Employment Tax, which goes to page 1, page 1040, page 1. And so now we've got the 100,000 minus the adjustments to income gives us the adjusted gross income minus the standard deduction and we have this qualified business uh, deduction 15817 uh, which is of course significant taxable income uh, 63268 page 2 calculating the not only the federal income tax but also the self employment tax to come out to the 23 357. So you can see that same 100,000 net income results in a whole lot more complexity with the Schedule C. However, with the Schedule C, we also might have a loss. So, and b by the way, when I compared this to a Schedule E, what's going to happen? We're not going to have possibly uh, the, the taxes for Social Security here on the income side of things, which means we're not going to have this above the line half of that being a deduction and we're not going to have the qualified business income deduction typically uh, however uh, if we have a loss what's the story with a loss if i have a loss on the schedule c i'm not going to have any of that stuff either because i'm not going to owe any any self-employment tax if i lost money uh, and then the question is, do I get to take the loss against other income, which I'm more likely to be able to do with the Schedule C than the Schedule E? All right, so let's go back on over and say, okay, well, what if I had a loss here? Let's say this was my expenses came out to be 140000 So now my expenses are bigger than my uh, income. So that's impossible to happen with the W-2. Is possible to happen to set with the Schedule C. So now I have 120 of income, but it took me 140 to get it. And notice losses are typical with businesses in some years, especially the beginning years or expansion years for a Schedule C. They're actually even more likely possibly in some types of rental property, given the fact that you own the rental property, not just to generate the rental income, but also possibly as a hedge against inflation and possibly also as a way to hope that the property goes up in value in terms of just capital gains because of simply location, which means you might be willing to consume losses, especially if you can take them against other income. So we have the 20,000 here of, of a loss. We don't have any self-employment tax because there's no income and so on. And, and so therefore, if I, go, if I go back on over, it goes to the schedule one, there's the 20,000, and then it goes to the form 1040. So there's our 20,000. And, and now I have the standard deduction uh, here of the 13850. That's not helping me out, though, because I already had the loss, right? And so this loss from the expenses of the business, ordinary and necessary business expenses greater than the income is what we typically think about as saying, hey, if I can't take this now because I have no income to take it against, do I get a business? Do I get a benefit from it possibly rolling it forward? In other words, first thought, hey, IRS, you're my silent partner. When, you, when I make money, you take part of it. When I lose money, you should reimburse me for part of it. You should give me money for the loss that I had here. Again, the IRS is going to say, no, we don't do that. We only take money, but we might give you a benefit from the loss if you make funny money in the future, right? So if you make money in the future, maybe we'll be able, you can net this against it, but we're not going to pay you for making the bad decision, right? We're, we're, or, or at least we don't know if it's good or bad because it might pay off in the long run, but the IRS isn't going to pay you for the loss, right? So then the question is, well, can I net it out against something out? If I don't have any other income to net it out against, then the question is, well, what if I have income next year 
could I net it out against next year's income? And that's going to be the NOL uh, calculation. So here's our, our NOL uh, worksheets. Now, if I did have income, let's add some income back to our W-2 income and say W, we have a W-2 now. Do, 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 here, W, we'll put the 100,000 back in, go back to the forms for the W-2 income. And now we have something to take that against. Now we've got the 100,000 from other income and the business we had of the 20,000 is now being netted out. So I'm getting, a biz I'm getting a benefit from the loss. So if all I had was a loss, the government's not gonna pay me for the loss, even though they're kind of our silent partner, but possibly I can take that loss against the other income if I had other income to net it out against. And if I can't, possibly I can roll it forward. Okay, what about on the Schedule E? Well, if I have income on the Schedule E, the IRS is gonna take part of it because they're our silent partner. If we have a loss, then the questions still come up, but we might have those added components that can add more complexity, such as at-risk limitations and the passive activity loss uh, limitations. So let's do that. Let's go back on over and say, okay, well, what if I'm gonna delete the W-2 and then I'm gonna go to the Schedule C and say, I'm gonna delete the Schedule C. And then let's say we had income from the Schedule E income, from the rental property. So now we're gonna say that we had income if we start off from the 120,000 and then advertise, well, wait, that's 1 million. 120, 120,000 and then advertising at 20,000. That's gonna give us our net income of uh, 100,000. Let's go to the Schedule E and just give us that default information. So I'm gonna scroll down and say, okay, our general income statement, 120,000 minus the 20,000 means that we have uh, the 100,000. Uh, so, so if I net up all the properties, which I only have the one, we have basically the 100,000. That's gonna flow through to the Schedule 1, this time on line five, rental real estate instead of Schedule 3 from the business income. That goes to the Form 1040. And we've got the 100,000, the 13,850. Uh, and it looks a lot like the W-2 income because I don't have the self-employment tax because the idea of the rental property is that by default it is passive, therefore not subject to the self-employment tax, which is typically the active component. So that's a huge benefit from the rental property versus the W-2 even because they and the because the w-2 they already you already paid it it was just taken out already in the w-2 and from the business property which you have to pay the self-employment tax on but you don't get this qualified business income deduction typically obviously we don't have the above the line deduction because we don't have any self-employment deduction and we don't have the tax we only have we don't have the self-employment tax we only have the federal income tax calculated on the income side all right, what if we have a loss then on the rental property? And remember, that's quite likely to happen because if you have a second house, for example, that you're renting out, you're probably holding on to it, not just to generate to day-to-day -day income through rental property, but again, to hold on to it for passive investment, to hedge against inflation, and, and so on and so forth, which means you might be willing to take a loss still holding on to the property in order to have those other benefits with it hedge against inflation and the property value might go up just in terms of passive capital gains just from the location of the property even if you didn't do much to it but if i so if i say this is at 140 thousand we're going to say all right let's go back on over now we have a loss situation so if i go back to uh the schedule e so now we have 120 We've got a loss situation. So now we have uh, 20,000 on the loss that still flows into the schedule one, there it is. And then on the form 1040, we see it uh, flowing in here, but there's nothing else to net it out against. And therefore, therefore uh, it's, it's not really helping us out at this point in time. And the question is, do we get an NOL uh, from it possibly being able to take it against future losses. 
All right, now let's say that we did have W-2 income. So let's say we had other income from W-2 to net out against. So W-2 income at the 100,000. And by the default settings that I put in here, it's allowing us to take the 20,000 loss against the 100,000. Now, now, why is that? Because typically there's gonna be a passive loss uh, rule that allows us to take up to if we're actively participating up to like 25,000. So let me bring this our loss higher. Let's say the loss, let's bring this up to 160,000 and then go back on over and say, so now the loss, if I go to the schedule E is at, uh, is, is at the loss of 40,000 but they basically capped it deductible rental real estate loss at the 25,000. So there's the 25,000 that's pulling in to the form 1040. And so it's been limited. Why has it been limited? Because of the passive activity rules. So I'm gonna go into the form uh, 8582. So here's our form 8582, the passive activity rules. Now the idea here is Unlike the Schedule C business, where if you were a service business, you're basically actively working and the revenue is the is the is is your primary goal the, the service revenue is going to be your primary goal and objective. And therefore, it's an active activity. The rental income, the idea is, well, the rent, you're not doing much. The rental property is just sitting there and you're just collecting the rent. Now, you could argue against that. You could say, well, I have to manage that, and that's quite difficult these days, and, and that's the argument in between, which uh, when you get into that debate, you get into the question of, okay, we'll meet you in the middle, says the IRS. We'll give you, if you actively participate, part of the passive losses. So again, the idea would be, you shouldn't get the passive loss, uh, you shouldn't get passive losses from passive activities because it's passive. You're not actively participating, you're just collecting rents. And then obviously people that do a lot of real estate and do work actively on it, managing the people that are renting and so on and so forth, are saying I should get at least some benefits similar to the Schedule C people that get losses because we are actively doing and so on. And so then you get this uh, $25,000 rule which does have limits for AGI income limitations, which we'll take a look at. All right, so given that, let's just take a look at this sheet. So we've got passive activity losses, rental real estate activities with active participation. So on B, acti uh, activities with net loss, the 40,000, all other passive activities, we don't have any other. Combining those together, there's our loss of the 40,000. Part two, special allowance for rental real estate activities with, there's the keyword, active participation. So enter the smaller of loss on line 1D or on line three. So here's the income limitation. Enter 150,000 if married filing separately. Uh, see instructions. So we're putting the, the 150. So the modified adjusted gross income, we had the 100,000 of our adjusted gross income. So subtracting those two out, we have uh, 50,000 multiply line seven by 50%. Do not enter more than 25,000. So we're capped in essence at the 25,000. So total loss allowed then the 25,000 and then complete this part uh, before part one lines to da, da, da. And this is the, the losses of the 40,000 that we put up top. And then we can look at page number two, where it says we have part number uh, six. Use this part if an amount is shown on part three, line nine. So here we have the loss, here we have the ratio. The special allowance was 25,000. And if we subtract the two out, we have 15,000 uh, that, that wasn't allowed, right? So then we have down here, uh, the loss, the ratio, the unallowed loss was 15,000. And so here we have the allowed loss and the unallowed loss. So we're getting a benefit from the 25,000, but not the 15. So then of course the question is, well, do I get to, do I get to deduct the 15 possibly in the future? And if we go out into the general information, we have our general information over here for the carry forwards. So unallowed passive losses, uh, 15,000. So in other words, if we get to take it going forward, 
you would think it would be subject to the same limitations. In other words, passive income and losses staying in their own lane. You can't really take it against other income except for, in this case, up to the 25000 as long as you're still actively participating and your income is below the threshold to be able to maximize that. So that's going to be the idea. Now, that could be a problem oftentimes for many people to maximize their losses because they might be having losses in multiple years because, again, they're kind of holding on to it for capital gains and therefore they're never really able to realize the losses against other income, which could be a problem that comes up. Also, a lot of people will, that are more well-off people that have second properties might have incomes above the threshold where even if they're actively participating, they might not get the 25,000 of, of the losses, right? Is the general idea. So those are the things to keep in mind. So and if I go back on over and if we look at uh, the settings here, we could say down here, it says, did not actively participate. Are they a real estate professional or rental other real estate? So I'm gonna say, what if they did not actively participate? So I'm going to say, if that were the case, then I can go back on over and go, okay, well, then I have my Schedule E. I still have a, a loss of the 40000 but none of it is being allowed here because it's all passive, right? Well, that's an e-signature one. So if I go into the passive activities now, the $40,000 loss, none of it has been allowed because they're not actively participating. What do you have to do to actively participate? You would think that you're the one possibly that's interacting, doing the, you know, possibly the bookkeeping, possibly, you know, talking to the to the tenants and uh, advertising and that kind of stuff. And you might not do that. You might say, hey, look, I'm just going to hire a management company to do all of that because I don't want to deal with it. And if you do that, then it's more likely that you're not actively participating, which means that if you have losses which you're more likely to have because now you're paying a real estate company to, to handle all that, <laughs> then then you might not be able to take the losses against other income. You might be able to still take the losses against passive income, but you don't have any. You know, you could roll it forward into the future, but you're not going to be able to, to get a benefit from the losses typically until uh, there's some some active or passive activity income would be the general idea. All right, let's go back to where we were before and say, okay, well, that's fine. But what if we actively participate, which is usually kind of the default for the for the property. So if you're doing the, if you put this into the tax software, it's kind of like assumed, you actively participate unless you say don't actively participate. And then you could be a real estate professional. We talked about some of those different terminologies in a prior presentation. Let's say let's say we had this loss, but now my income is higher. Let's say my income is at 150,000. Let's say 160,000. Boom. And so I go back on over and say, okay, so now you would think I had a loss, but, and I have, I actively participate, but right here, we've got the 150,000 if married filing separately, and we're, we're over the threshold. So once again, again, we're not getting the loss even though we actively participate. In other words, one, one more time, if I brought this below the threshold of 100,000, then I could say, okay, let's do this W to this one. Then I get the 25,000 of a loss. But if it goes above to 160,000, now my income's too high and I phased out that loss. Now that 150 used to be pretty high when they first put this in, because it's been a long time since they changed these numbers. But with inflation, of course, that's not as high as it used to be, right? That's not as much money as it used to be because of inflation, right? So that's interesting. And if I go into like 130,000, so now uh, now I'm in between. So so you're gonna basically say, hey, look, it's gonna phase out your the amount of loss that you might get caps at 120,000, and then it phases out uh, completely after 150,000 for most taxpayers. And that's the case, even if you are married filing joint. So that's the other thing that's a little bit tricky here, because if I, you would think that if I change the filing status to married filing joint, 
then the income thresholds would double. But married, filing joint, if I pull back on over, now we have two people, married, filing joint, and we still only get the 10,000. It didn't boost it up to the maximum of 25, or you would think the maximum might then be 50 if, if uh, that were uh, the case, if we were a married couple. All right, and let me just clarify these three again here. So remember, if you're by default, they're going to say that you actively participate typically if you're talking about the rental property. If you have a management company and it's totally passive, then you'd have to say it's passive, which means you're limited on the losses. And then if it was a hotel or something like that, that's when you might possibly use like a Schedule C because it's a lot of service. And then the real estate, and then you have the real estate professional if you're an active real estate professional, which we talked about in a prior presentation, which might still be reported on the Schedule E. All right, now the other thing to point out here is that note that when we apply, when we think about someone who is has a married couple, which we're looking at now, then when you're married, we think, okay, now you're one entity and your income is the, together and you should be taxed at one income level. But we know that sometimes that becomes a problem, especially when you put in Social Security and Medicare, because the Social Security and Medicare is allocated by Social Security number, which may not impact the tax return when you create it, but will impact the benefits that are paid out at the point of retirement. So that means that if you have a business, real estate, or possibly like a Schedule C, then the question is, if you own it jointly, even if you're a married couple, the, the, you might still be considered to be a partnership, in which case you'd have to file, you would think, a partnership return and so that you can then so that you can make like the Schedule E for the entity itself as a flow through entity, which would then flow through to your form 1040s with the Schedule K1. Now, that's not as big of a problem or as easy to see why that might be important with the Schedule E because you don't typically have Social Security and Medicare because it's passive. But, but the same kind of concept applies. So let me just show you like what I mean with a Schedule C and then the same idea kind of applies. So in other words, like when I look at the income, I can think of it as joint, as this income is for taxpayer one or the spouse or it's, it's joint. Now, when you think of the joint amount, you would say, well, can't I just take the Schedule C and allocate it evenly between the two people because they're a married couple? And in some states, it might be more likely to do that when you have a community property state. And that would be the easy thing to do if it was joint. But in some states, you might not be able to do that, in which case you might have the, this qualified joint venture situation which instead of having a separate partnership return that flows through with the Schedule K-1s, you might have then uh, two Schedule E's basically just breaking out the amount allocated to each partner in accordance with their percentage, which might be 50-50 or possibly in that case, you could do something other than the 50-50. Let, so let me show you this concept with a, with a, uh, uh, a Schedule C because it's more clear because of the Social Security as to why this might uh, be the case. So I'm going to delete this and let's just say we did the same thing. Let's go back to our Schedule C scenario. So now we're going to say we had income of 120,000 and then we have uh, advertising of 20,000. So that, there is our income. So now we're a married couple and we have uh, the income there K okay, PA, so 120, 20. How come I have W2 income? Let's get rid of the W2 income. Du, 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 delete that. Delete. Du, du. And so now we have the du, du, the married couple with 100,000 of the income. So if I look at the schedule SE, you can see that all of that is being applied to Adam because I said the business was Adams or the taxpayers. Now, if they were, if, if it was, if it was, of course, the spouse's business, I would have to make sure in the software to say, hey, look, it's the spouse's business. And that's important because even though it does not impact the tax return, you still have the same tax, the same payment for 
the tax and and the the added tax of the self of the self employment tax, but it's assigned to a different person with the schedule S E. So now it's assigned to Jane. That means it's going to impact Jane's uh, social security benefits, which will then be paid out right to her. Rather, right, so that's going to impact the payments on Social Security, which is tied to, to each of the individual numbers. Now, if you're in a community property state, the easiest way to deal that with that is to say, well, they both own the business and we will make it joint. So if I make it joint, then I can basically split it in two and I have just one Schedule C, nice and easy. And then I can say I have two uh, self-employment tax schedules, one applied to uh, to to each spouse. So they broke out the income evenly between 50-50. Now, remember that you might get into tax planning, especially if you're in your later years and say, okay, if I have self-employment tax, is there a way that I can have one person active more in the business than the other and therefore earn more self-employment income, which might increase the benefits that we're going to get at retirement? And if you get into that tax planning, which again, is possibly something to do more close to retirement. If you're farther away from retirement, you're probably going to say, hey, look, the Social Security might totally change. It's going to hit the fan at some point and and possibly whoever's currently in the system is going to milk it for everything they got. And younger people are going to someone's going to end up holding the bag. It's a Ponzi scheme. Right. So you might I wouldn't depend on it. Right. But if you're close to the, the, the retirement, then it might be worth mapping out but as you as you look at that remember there's a cap on the social security part if you if your income level goes above a certain threshold so for example if if our income was not uh was higher let's make this uh 220 thousand, and then go back on over and say okay so now and let's let's imagine first that it was just applied to one person, the taxpayer, boom. So now I'm going to say it's it's 200,000 and the social security part uh, got capped and at uh, the 160 here, right? So my if we if we keep in mind just the total amount is 25225. Now if I split it between two of two people, the cap is basically doubled, right? Because they both hit the cap. It's the cap per social security number, not per tax return. So if you have income higher than than the cap, then you might end up paying more social security when you're trying to get higher benefits, which might defeat the point of doing it. So we're gonna go back on over and say, well, what if I go back to joint and now I'm gonna say, okay, so now they split it evenly between the two and the total is basically if i get the trustee calculator here duh, 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 we're going to say the total is 14129 times two right twenty eight thousand. see here's page two here's the 14. so twenty eight thousand versus what it was before taxpayer due at the 25,000, right? So you're paying more because that cap that cap is is was on one person and now you have the cap on two people, which means that it you can have more income that would be under the cap now that you're splitting it. Now if you're not a community property uh state, then you might actually have to have like two schedule Cs that break out each line item between the two people, which is kind of a pain. So, so, but that's another way that, you, and that's a qualified joint venture. So those are just some, now the same concept, by the way, applies to the schedule E, but it seems like it's not as, or it's not, doesn't seem like it's as big a deal, given the fact that again, you might not have any social security uh, that's being uh, applied here. So whether it goes to one taxpayer or the other taxpayer might have some impacts on some other parts of the return but so it's still you still want to do it properly but it's not as obvious that it's going to that what it's going to hit with the social security as it is with the schedule c which has a social security now just to get a look at the schedule e again if you had multiple properties 
because some people are going to have if you have well off clients or something they're going to have like multiple properties oftentimes of course which which complicate you know just gets messier looking the concepts are still the same but you might have like like multiple rental property so you could say that you have uh rents at let's say the 120,000 and then advertising 20,000 and then you might have another property and maybe it has a loss so maybe this was at 100,000 and you have like uh 130,000 here so one has income one has a loss if i go back to my forms then on the schedule e now we have property a b c and if there's more than c then i'm going to have two sheets so i can see more properties but the point is one has income one has a loss and because they're both in the same lane both classified as passive activities you would think that you would be able to net those two together which comes out to a net gain of the seventy thousand, which is in the lane of passive activities if the net came out to be a loss here then that's when you would be restricted possibly to the twenty-five thousand. so you so what you do is you say i'm going to take all the passive stuff and the passive property first possibly here and net those out and then see what my net gain or loss is in the lane of passive activities and then basically deal with your passive activity rules from there if there's income it's fine the the iris will take some of it if it's a loss you get into the questions of whether you actively participated and whether your income is low enough to be able to take advantage of part of it with that twenty-five thousand amount uh, to deduct and if you can't deduct it then it's in the lane of passive activities that you might be able to carry forward to future income which could possibly net against future passive income and possibly be subject to once again the twenty-five thousand amount to deduct for the rental property if you actively participate possibly in the future for example that's the general idea